Hi, I'm Paul Jay. Welcome to the analysis.news. I'll be back in just a few seconds to talk with Patrick Coburn about the war in Ukraine. Uh, please don't forget there's a donate button, a subscribe button, and most importantly, uh, get to the website, the analysis.news. And if you're not on our email list, sign up there because we've been having lots of trouble with YouTube. And the most reliable thing is to get on our email list and go to the website. I'll be back in just a few seconds. In a recent article, veteran journalist Patrick Coburn wrote, I feel frustrated with those who condemn war atrocities, but then use them as a reason to go on fighting a war that will inevitably produce even more such atrocities. Yet there are a growing number of politicians and pundits willing to fight to the last Ukrainian to defeat the Russian bear. Some of this is fueled by popular outrage at Russian brutality against civilians, which is on television every night. Politicians, particularly in Washington and London, relish the thought of Russia being trapped in a Ukrainian quagmire without much concern about what happens to more than 40 million Ukrainians living on this battlefield. Roaring again is an almost lighthearted belief that Putin would never use tactical nuclear or chemical weapons in this conflict. Where this confidence comes from is a mystery to me. Now joining me is Patrick Coburn. He's an award-winning columnist specializing in the Middle East, a foreign correspondent in Moscow, Washington, Jerusalem, Belfast, Beirut, and Baghdad. Patrick is also the author of nine books, including The Rise of Islamic State, which was translated into 18 languages. He wrote with his son, Henry, the best-selling Henry's Demons Living with Schizophrenia, which was a finalist for the Costa Books Award. His latest book, Behind Enemy Lines, was published in October. Thanks very much for joining me, Patrick. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, there's a lot of themes in your article I found interesting, but, but let's start with, I guess, the most crucial. Um, it, it, what exactly does NATO, West, the United States, if, if Putin does have, so, have, have some kind of way out of this uh, that doesn't look like a complete disaster, uh, then, as you suggest in your article, isn't the West inviting even more disaster? I think one of those remarkable things about this uh, war is that uh, the objectives of uh, Putin and Russia and the objectives of the West are very unclear. Uh, does Putin want to uh, permanently conquer Ukraine? At the very beginning, he made suggestions uh, that implied that denazification getting rid of the uh, Ukrainian uh, leadership, surrender of the army. That's disappeared. Uh, what, but, uh, and people, there's been commentary on this, but what are the Western objectives? You know, is it to uh, simply stop Putin in Ukraine? Is it a regime change in Russia? Um, the, uh, many of the things which are said imply regime change in Russia. This talk of putting Putin on trial and so forth. You only do that if you've uh, decisively defeated an enemy. So there's a sort of vagueness about this crucial issue. And uh, to pick up another theme which I was trying to address in this article, uh, there's this ambivalent or contradictory attitude to Putin. On the one hand is to say, uh, this man is a complete demon, he's mad, uh, he's... Um, sort of a Russian equivalent uh, of Hitler, at least, uh, or some fascist leader, but generally uh, uh, Hitler is often um, brought up. But at the same time, you, if you then say, well, hold on a minute, if this war goes on and on, uh, the one trump card that Russia does have is the possession of uh, nuclear weapons, both strategic and tactical. Uh, and then you find people remarkably on this crucial issue, who have uh, been saying that uh, Putin is a satanic figure, saying that somehow you'll never dare use uh, nuclear weapons. <laughs> but uh, why should they be so sure of that, given their uh, beliefs about uh, the nature of Putin and his regime? 
Well, let's return to this issue of, of the th possibility or th veiled threat about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Uh, and, and let's start with what do you make of just what is what are Putin's objectives? If the objective is uh, the uh, is to have a land bridge to the Crimea to defend Donbass. Um, first of all, I, 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 let me just say, I, people who watch the analysis know how I feel about this. It, it's totally illegal. It was totally unjustified. Um, and so as we discuss this, I, 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 you know, I, I think you agree. That's the starting point is there was absolutely no uh, justification for this invasion. That said, uh, first of all, let me ask you, do you agree with that as a premise? So. Oh, yo, yes, I do. Um, uh, I think there's no uh, justification for it. I think the, it was a sort of crazy idea. I thought that Putin might invade at some point because this uh, Russian saber rattling, the problem about saber rattling is uh, that uh, you get diminishing returns unless you take out the saber, which I thought I might do. But I thought that they would at least wait till they had enough troops to get somewhere uh, and not sort of uh, wander into Ukraine uh, on the assumption that they were going to be welcomed by the people throwing sweets and uh, flowers at them, you know, which is ludicrous. Uh, so I think uh, wholly uh, unjustified in uh, what they did. And, and there's, there are uh, Russian-speaking cities that are fighting back against the Russian invasion. Is that correct? Yeah, something sort of in the east. I mean, even in uh, Mariupol, you know, is um, where they've just, uh, the Russians have captured, I think, about uh, 1,100 uh, Ukrainian uh, Marines, but all these Marines who are interviewed on Russian television speak Russian. Uh, and um, so, you know, it's a very simple thing. If you fire missiles at people, if you're on the receiving end of missiles, and I've been sort of shelled quite a lot in Baghdad and Beirut and other places, you do not feel good about the people who are firing shells and missiles at you. You know, it's a visceral reaction that you immediately dislike them. So whether you're a Ukrainian or Russian speaker, uh, you're likely to respond in the same way. Particularly, you know, if you're sort of, you know, your neighbor, grandmother, Katya, you know, in the house next door to you has just had her legs blown off, you know, that you, you feel real angry about it. Um, so it's not surprising that uh, they respond in this way. So I always thought that the uh, the uh, invasion was A, wrong, and B, crazy. So, you know, it, it, on the face of it, and a lot of people have made this comment, it, it, the, the way the Biden administration uh, was talking about an invasion's coming and invasion's coming, it, it really did seem like they were goading Putin into invading. Um, many analysts were saying the, the troops on the border and threat was actually being somewhat effective. Uh, the Germans were... Uh, Continuing with mm. Nord Stream 2, uh, there, there was a somewhat mm. uh, d lack, lack of unity in NATO. And the same analysts were saying, but if he actually invades, NATO's going to unite. And that's, uh, it, it really does look like Putin has done just what the U.S. wanted him to do. Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it was, uh, and, and this was very predictable. It was difficult beforehand to think of any upside from the point of view of Putin in Russia. Of actually carrying out an invasion. It was very easy to see there was an upside in threatening to carry out an invasion. Uh, and what made it even more negative was, you know, that they carried out this sort of uh, strange sort of invasion that presupposed they'd have no resistance. You know, they sort of sent in penny packets of troops from all directions. The whole thing was very amateur and based, so far as I can see, on a political fantasy that there wouldn't be any uh, any real resistance. Well, we know, and this was predictable, that there was a great deal of resistance. Well, it reminds me. Go ahead. No, it reminds me of Saddam Hussein. You know, in 1990, or um, Saddam actually did it twice. He invaded Iran. Remember, in uh, 1980 attacking a more populous country with, uh, you know, uh, which had just had a revolution, which was predictably disastrous, and uh, there was a disaster, and uh, 
Then he did it again in a rather different way, invading Kuwait in 1990. Um, and why did he do it? I think some of the you know conventional explanations are probably correct that uh, isolate he was isolated due to uh, COVID. I think that autocracies um, and you know, particularly in Putin's autocracy become like sort of monarchies that you the guy at the top takes all the decisions and the people around him become more and more courtiers. There are people who are appointed because they say uh, yes to the boss and never contradict him. Um, and after 22 years in power, Putin seems to have been surrounded by uh, guys, his old pals from the FSB, the Russian uh, um, intelligence service, I mean, um, what used to be the, K the KGB, and other people who are, who are courtiers who just sort of agreed with him. Um, there's one other factor, you know, that this is a bit like Russia is a sort of oil state, it sells natural resources and uh, so forth. Uh, you know, the government doesn't have to do much to uh, uh, get revenues and all the oil states sort of have an equal level of incompetence so far as I can see. But that's a slightly different point. Um, one would think Putin's logic at this point is that if he controls, at the end of all this, controls Donbass, has a land bridge to the Crimea, then that's a victory. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that, he ne that this move towards Kyiv was never serious. Uh, and he'll call, you know, even now, he and others that sort of defend the Russian position say, in fact, what, what's happening on the ground is more or less what they wanted. Yeah, I guess they they say that, but it could, it's that they didn't behave like that. You know, they uh, attacked towards Odessa, they attacked towards Kiev, Kharkiv, uh, many other targets, um, and um, so uh, now they you know they they're looking for some victory. But they, rather amazingly, after more than fifty days of this war, they haven't won any won any victories. Uh, you know, it, it, it shows a real level of incompetence not to have won a victory anywhere. But these places, you know, Kharkiv is very close to the Russian border. You know, it used to be Moscow correspondent. The, um, you know, Kiev isn't that far. Uh, you know, these aren't foreign expeditions. Uh, it's not like sort of intervening in Russia, intervening in Afghanistan in 1970. Uh, 1979. Um, this should have been easy, uh, and they seem to have made a complete mess of it. So, you know, if they can win some sort of victory there, and take Mariupol and uh, say, "Look, we defended the Donbass," and uh, he can claim something. But uh, uh, you know, it's it's a tremendous um, expenditure of energy. It's united. Uh, NATO, it's uh, uh, which would seem to be sort of a dying institution. Uh, it's weakened the European Union, and lots of other ways. It's sort of uh, you know, uh, it's weakened Russia and the Middle East and Central Asia. You know, this is a real disaster, and I wonder if uh, how far uh, Putin will be able to get away with that. The talk about American NATO objectives. I mean, it's, it seems the objective is a long, drawn out, dragged out war, as you say in your article, uh, to the last Ukrainian, to weaken Russia. Uh, but why do they consider Russia such a, th it's a threat? It, it's, uh, or is this purely a play to, uh, you know, sell a lot of arms and, and you know, first you, you militarize Ukraine, and then Russia can come in and destroy it, and then then you can spend a lot of money remilitarizing it and, and rebuilding it. I mean, you know, when I talk to your brother, your brother has a book, Spoils of War, a Andrew, and, and essentially, you know, he makes the argument that a lot of these wars go on, you know, really purely for money making. There isn't some great geopolitical thinking behind it. Yeah, I, th I mean, that's true. I didn't, um and I think that, you know, one can be over sophisticated in explaining why these wars go on, um, that uh, selling weapons and 
creating an atmosphere, you know, of a new Cold War is, you know, is really good for military budgets and high military budgets are good for uh, um, people who manufacture and sell arms. Um, you know, there are other factors that, you know, let's say in Britain and America that um, Boris Johnson and uh, Joe Biden can hope to make sort of po you know, pose as uh, statesmen, make political gains out of this. Um, the um, um, the uh, NATO becomes sort of more important. Uh, the European Union becomes less important. Um, you know, quite things are going their way. You know, and states politicians kind of like wars when they seem to be victorious. Uh, and it's striking how little effort they've made to end the war. I mean, you know, the the there's even talking about negotiations is sort of treated almost as a sort of form of form of treachery. And it was uh, like that right you know, in the beginning, at a time when they could have signaled uh, the fact, um, they being the Americans, other European countries, uh, th they could have signaled more strongly that there's no way Ukraine was on its way to membership in NATO, and everyone knew that. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're not. They were not going to get consensus on uh, Ukraine joining. I, I can't imagine Turkey would have agreed, and certainly even France and Germany really were opposed to it. But instead of strongly signaling that was never going to happen, uh, they kept just reinforcing Ukraine's right to join uh, in, in a way that was actually provocative. And and that's is that not what their plan was to be provocative? I think it was. I mean, one of the bizarre things was they wanted to assert Ukraine's right to join NATO and at the same time say that soldiers, no soldier from a NATO country would actually enter Ukraine to defend Ukraine. So they were provoking the Russians, but at the same time sort of tempting them by saying that they wouldn't actually enter Ukraine. Um, and uh, you know, so I mean, this, um, you know, they certainly had an incentive to sort of uh, uh, weaken Russia to push uh, NATO eastwards. Um, how far they saw that this was going to provoke a direct invasion, although they kept saying there was going to be an invasion, they, I mean, they, now they get credit for having predicted it, but they, they kept on saying it week after week and it didn't happen. Um, the so I'm not sure uh, how far they uh, expected things to break so well in their favor, you know, but they're making a lot of gains over this uh, politically at home uh, and abroad, you know, in the Middle East, uh, Russia will be a weakened power. Uh, I mean, you mentioned uh, Turkey. Turkey will be another beneficiary fr from this. The NATO, but NATO and uh, Russia will probably be the big gainers. I mean, the, the cynicism um, about all this arms trade. Turkey is is acting as a sort of a peacemaker, hosting the negotiations, uh, selling arms mm. to uh, the uh, Ukrainians, especially mm. this uh, drone, which apparently is very effective. Uh, I mean, this this is so much about the arms industry and arms dealing. Uh, in fact, Ukraine was actually an arms exporting competitor to Russia. Uh, it, it's such a filthy business being, uh, but, but, I, but I do want to raise another issue, uh, which is in a lot of the interviews I know I've been doing and others sort of in alternative media, we focus a lot about the geopolitics and the US and, we've, and, and Russia. And, and a lot of the Ukrainian progressives are saying, you know, you're missing what we are. Uh, there's, there's several Ukrainian socialist organizations and, 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 and left-wing uh, sites and groups, and, and they're saying, you know, we're fighting a national liberation movement here, and you guys are kind of missing that piece of the story, as if the Ukrainian people who are fighting are only some extension of the Ukrainian government, and, and that it isn't, there mm. isn't a people's uh, resistance here. Sure, yeah, I think that that's a very reasonable point. <clears throat> One of the problems about this sort of 24-7 wall-to-wall media coverage is that it sort of focuses on a few points. It doesn't focus on domestic uh, Ukrainian politics. 
um, and it doesn't focus on people who feel like that, that simply they're a nation resisting a sort of imperialist uh, invasion and occupation. Um, and, and the people so, I'm reading, uh, talking to, also want, you know, when this is, they can't say no NATO now, because uh, that's the only way they have means to resist, but they want no NATO at the end of this. Yeah, and, um, you know, they want to retain their, their independence or gain their independence. <coughs> Excuse me. But, you know, remember at the beginning of this, in sort of January, February, when Washington and London and others was talking this up, saying Russia's going to invade, the Ukrainians were talking it down, saying, you know, we don't see any sign of this on the ground. The situation is the same as before. Yeah, so what do you make of that? Uh, so they can see... They can see the danger, I think, of just becoming a Western proxy. Remember also, you know, that there are 44 million uh, Ukrainians and 5 million of them have already fled the country, I think, according to uh, the UN. Uh, they could end up with a large chunk of that population as refugees. So if you go back to what were NATO objectives, <coughs> Even before the invasion began, you had a lot of uh, American congressmen, senators, you know, pitch, uh, advocating sending small arms to Ukraine uh, so Ukrainians could fight the Russians in the streets. This is before the invasion. Uh, there was no attempt to actually stop the invasion by uh, conceding some obvious points, uh, NATO for one. Uh, but but the other one, what do you make of the issue of Donbass? Because this is supposed to be, you know, one of the main justifications for the Russian invasion was a, a possible genocide against Donbass, uh, the attacks on Donbass. But when I look at the actual numbers that the United Nations reports on deaths in Donbass from the U Ukrainian government, uh, from 2018 to 2021, I think it's 310 civilians dead. Uh, that does not a genocide make. Um, so what do you make of that? And then what is the solution for dealing with Donbass? Yeah, I think that that's, uh, so reporting of that's been pretty deceptive, as I think a round figure is given of 14,000 or something since 2014. And what isn't said, that almost all of these were killed in the first two years. So the the it was really pretty quiet before this. I mean, it's, it's tougher for the 300 people, but... You know, this is um, an area with a population of several millions. Um, you know, then we had, there was this sort of agreement, this uh, Minsk II, so-called, um, which you know, seemed to me to be the basis of a, a longer-term agreement that uh, you had uh, the um, two Luhansk and Donetsk, the uh, two sort of what are now. Uh, claim, they claim independence, but um, previously were the two sort of separatist areas um, were uh, are really quite sort of, uh, uh, these were quite sort of limited problems, but they were ones that could be resolved. In terms of Ukrainian agency, the Ukrainian government itself could have done something and, and, and declared they were not going to join NATO. Uh, but they, they they didn't do that. I, I mean, prior to yeah, the I, <clears throat> yeah. I, I think <clears throat> they didn't do various things. Maybe probably because they were being pushed by the Americans and others not to do that. But I don't want to get to the stage of saying you know the Russians certainly had grievances. They certainly felt threatened. They certainly had arguments for this. But they didn't have grievances which justified an invasion. And that invasion has actually made all the things that the Russians said might happen to them, but probably wouldn't happen to them, happen. So it's, you know, it's been an extraordinarily self-destructive operation from their point of view. From, from a, 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 an actual military point of view, does it make any difference at all if there's nuclear weapons in Ukraine or they're in Poland to Russia? I mean, I don't see how, you know, what well, is it, 10 it seconds does, difference? Yeah, it, yeah, you could say, or, you know, nuclear weapons, you know, and being fired from, uh, you know, North Dakota, um, I think it does, yeah, because it sort of, 
it makes means that any issue between Russia and Ukraine immediately becomes a nuclear issue. Um, I think also there's a mistake that people make, which is when people say, will there be a nuclear war, they imagine something, you know, Dr. Strangelove situation of somebody pressing the button and, you know, uh, aircraft take off with nuclear weapons or missiles are fired from silos long away, far away. But these days we've got tactical nuclear weapons, you know, that were designed to, the, the, you know, the first nuclear weapons had explosive power, you know, 3,000 times Hiroshima. Now you have tactical nuclear weapons that have half the power of Hiroshima. So you want to take out a convoy or you want to take out a, you know, a certain area, military area, you can do that if the Russians, uh, so it might be used on the battlefield. These are battlefield weapons. The Russians have talked up this option, and actually the Americans have as well, uh, the idea of using uh, nuclear weapons in what otherwise is a conventional war. Uh, it seems to me completely crazy because the other side, I mean, do you use nuclear weapons? You have a nuclear war, and the other side doesn't know whether you're going to use them Web missiles just with the payload of half of Hiroshima or several thousand times Hiroshima. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's incredibly dangerous. Dan Ellsberg calls uh, it institutional I, madness in his book, his doomsday book. I, I think the, the, when this is the point Ellsberg's made to me, but, but, but neither side will accept losing that exchange. So it has to spiral into more and more mm. nuclear weapons because you know, use and, and also happen that's so destructive it happens very fast you know the um, and I don't you know there's a sort of a lack of you know various sort of tripwires that existed during the first Cold War against the Soviet Union aren't there anymore you know various agreements that were reached on um, uh, what uh, weapons were available, but also contacts between the two sides to prevent, you know, accidental exchanges and so forth. That all these have we've sort of been uh, sort of forgotten about, ignored, or uh, removed over the last uh, 30 years. So it, it, in some many ways, it's much more dangerous now than it was in the height of the Cold War, when everybody was sort of super conscious of this, you know. You know, I remember I was at school during the Cuban Missile Crisis in uh, Scotland, and you know that there was real terror among the boys. You know, and, uh, everybody was frightened of this. We knew all about what a nuclear war might do. You know, and somehow that doesn't exist anymore. Well, what they're uh, using in many ways, they're using was, this terminology about tactical nuclear weapons, and they're not using mm. the word doomsday machine. Uh, this. This doesn't stay at yeah, the yeah. level of tactical nuclear weapons. Yeah, there's been a sort of, you know, yeah, that somehow, you know, it was actually rather, it was useful, you know, the idea that people who didn't know much about it still knew about mutual, you know, mad, mutual assured des uh, destruction. You know, once they start missile nuclear weapons start being used, then you can't stop it. And, uh, you know, uh, you have a, uh, you know, an, an apocalyptic war. Um, so I think that uh, that has sort of, the danger of that has got much sort of greater. The publics are less conscious of it, politicians are less conscious of it, um, military has been sort of slid into, um, slid tactical nuclear weapons into the agenda as a, as, a, as a possible option that somehow won't mean, we're mad, won't mean mutual assured destruction. But actually, you know, the, the basic calculations are exactly what they, what they used to be. Uh, the, it was on the, I think also, sorry, if yeah, I could make ahead, another yeah. point. Um, I think, you know, all this coverage of the atrocities, very real atrocities carried out by the, primarily by the Russians, um, and what gets underestimated is that we're not actually in the state of total war. You know, I've covered a lot of wars, mostly in the Middle East. And, you know, the level of sort of destruction by artillery. People always, you know, think about missiles, but most of the destruction is carried out by heavy artillery. You know, this isn't at, at 
at the scale of what we saw in a whole series of sieges in the Middle East, you know, whether it was, um, you know, the Syrian government in, uh, in Damascus or Aleppo or, you know, the Americans backing the Kurds in, in uh, Raqqa when that was held by Islamic State or Mosul when that was being attacked by the Iraqi army, uh, aided by American uh, airstrikes. You know, you could see whole, you know, Raqqa, I've, I've been in Raqqa, it's in northeast Syria, it's you know, a big city, and it, just everything is completely ruined, you know. This is worse than anything we've seen in Ukraine, and this could happen again. We've had these attacks on these cities, but other than Mariupol, we haven't had them surrounded yet. I mean, it's rather remarkable, maybe just the failure, the ineptitude, or uh, of uh, the Russian forces, but let's leave aside the reason. They haven't actually surrounded places like Kharkiv, even though they're so close to the Russian border. This could, But these things could happen in future. Uh, and, but I think that the sort of, a lot of this atrocity uh, reporting, not exactly it's untrue, but it's sort of, uh, uh, it focuses <coughs> on uh, things that have happened uh, as if this was the worst of the worst, and it isn't. Things could get an awful lot better. This isn't the violence so far. Isn't on the scale of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Damascus or uh, Aleppo or uh, you know Fallujah town outside uh, Baghdad. The, you this know, is the violence the, the, US. the, the Americans uh, waged yeah, against they, they the Iraqis. Yeah, they were blazing away with you know heavy artillery into built-up areas. Uh, and they'd say there, there was no, no civilians were there, they're taking great care. I mean, you know, there have been endless, not endless, but there have been quite a lot of good studies um, of what really happens when you open up with artillery in civilian areas. You know, they say we killed, you know, what, two civilians or so forth. When actually on the ground people investigate, you find, you know, that that's a, a it's really where they say they kill one person, they kill 50. And this is pervasive. Um, and this hasn't really happened in Ukraine yet, but it could happen. So this goes back to the beginning of the interview. Um, right, right now, as you said in your article, the, the politicians are essentially advocating uh, the, exactly what would lead to more atrocities. What you're saying now would lead to even greater devastation. But yeah. what's the alternative? What should the U.S. West what should the position be? I think that, it, you know, the, they need to work out what their objectives are uh, and then uh, see negotiations as a priority. At the moment, they don't even seem to think about them at all. Um, you know, the Russians need to do the same thing. Uh, what's their objective? Is it? You know, we'll see if they take Mariupol, that they have one victory under their belt. Uh, will they then see that as a moment that they might uh, produce a compromise or something like that? You know, I'm probably fairly pessimistic about it. Um, but uh, neither side has really spelled out what their objectives are or actually seem to know what their objectives are. Um, you know, it seems to me the leadership in Russia, leadership in Washington, in Europe is pretty low. You know, these are not people of any experience of war, uh, know much about it. Um, uh, you know, I did uh, Putin, you know, there's some small wars, Chechnya, I covered that in 99-2000, uh, just after he came to power, I was in uh, um, on the in, first one in Grozny and later on the outskirts of Grozny and uh, later in uh, Syria and uh, so forth. You know, the Russian army was uh, quite effective. Um, but these days it seems both ineffective and the political direction seems sort of crazy, really. Where, where could you get a sense of where Russian public opinion is? Uh, I had friends and I had, was talking to Russian friends who thought there would be some public support for the defense of Donbass. Although, as I say, the, the, the numbers don't bear out there was such a great threat to Donbass, but certainly a lot of people thought there were, a lot of Russian people thought. But he told me that if, if the Russian army, if the government went beyond Donbass, people would be very opposed to it. 
Um, there seems to be some opposition, but uh, s the reporting is the majority yeah, I think supporting. Down. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, you know what. One shouldn't take too much of a, a broad brush up uh, approach to this. I think when the first uh, sort of attack in Ukraine, you had a lot of quite vocal opposition from, you know, intellectuals and um, others, people who probably much like the government anyway, and you know, people went out and demonstrated. But then, you know, the the sort of the free press, such as it was, Novaya Gazeta, the newspaper, um, back in Moscow, radio. Um, these were all shut down, and there's complete domination by the uh, state, uh, state broadcasting. Uh, so that has died away. It's also, you know, if you demonstrate, you're likely to end up in prison for a rather a long time. Then, but on top of that, you had sort of sanctions, you know, and Russian sort of Paralympics suddenly being um, thrown out of the Paralympic Games. You know, this will not, you know, an ordinary Russian who thinks some poor sort of um, disabled guy who's you know made efforts for years to try and compete in some sport and suddenly he's thrown out. This does not make you feel good about the West, and that's the that's the history of sanctions. Actually, there these are a collective punishment. In some ways, they weaken the target, the country. Uh, you know, and there's no doubt it will weaken Russia. You know, uh, when Russian factories they produce and again, almost everything has a component from outside the country. I mean, this is true of industry everywhere. It's particularly true of, uh, in Russia at the moment. The warehouses will still have enough components, you know, but at a certain point, those components won't be there. If they can't get them from abroad, they can't produce anything. Um, so the pressure will be there, but, you know, sanctions tend to be a collective punishment which made people sort of look to the leadership. And uh, I've, you know, I've seen this in Iraq and Syria and elsewhere. Um, they don't uh, really weaken the uh, the regime. Um, but as time goes on, uh, you know, more unemployed um, because of this. You know, this uh, people don't feel may not feel good about the outside powers. They won't feel too good about the the leadership in the Kremlin either. I think as unemployment goes up um, and that you know there, there are lots of other sort of effects people don't really think about you know, you, you know countries in Central Asia you know Tajikistan and other places a very high proportion of their workforce works in Russia suddenly these guys are going to be out of a job it's going to destabilize these places um, the uh, um, you know there's <laughs> but I think that Russian public opinion. There's a, there's a final point I'd like to make, which is, you know, when you have public opinion, people say, "Well, I'm against, you know, um, for the war because they're attacking us Russians," you know. Uh, but at a certain point, uh, people's sons get uh, called up to the army; they start uh, getting killed. Uh, people have a very different attitude. That's something that people really care about: is threats to their to their. Uh, to um, sons of military age. Uh, remember, Russia hasn't really mobilized yet. You know, they, they're still saying this is not a war. This is a special military oper operation, which is, which is what Putin says. Uh, they could mobilize, uh, fully mo try and mobilize their manpower. Uh, that hasn't happened yet. And then you're in a completely different uh, universe when it comes to public opinion. Because th that's you know what people care about most. They care about their children. Uh, what to uh, what's likely to most worry them is the thought that you know young Ivan is you know he's going to be eighteen next year and he's going to go off to the wars and he stands a very good chance of being killed or injured. You know people really take that seriously. In a way, they might have more sort of vague uh, feelings about whether it's a good or bad idea to invade Ukraine. Uh, just finally. Uh Zelensky has said, although not in the last few days, I don't think, that U Ukraine really isn't going to get into NATO. Um, so if, if, if in, in, when it comes down to some kind of final negotiations and they, uh, you know, Ukraine agrees not to join NATO or for uh, 20 years or whatever that is, the real sticking point is going to be Donbass. And what 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 mm. is the uh, negotiated settlement on Donbass? There's going to have to be something. 
Well, it, it's more difficult now because they've sort of declared independence. But you know, if you had uh, them as a sort of uh, with regional powers, you know, um, you know, there was a possibility before this all happened that uh, they would um, participate in the political process in Kiev. They would, uh, but they would have. Uh, strong regional powers, but within Ukraine. Um, the problem is once you, once a war gets underway, you know, people have blood's been spilt, uh, things that were quite easy to do before the war get real difficult to do. You know, public people have, you know, you're a Ukrainian, you've seen sort of um, pictures on television of people who've, you know, uh, civilians have been shot in the head by Russian soldiers and so forth. The willingness to compromise goes down. You know, people, uh, foreign powers, you know, have their own agendas and so forth. Uh, it becomes very difficult to, to end the war. Um, and we're reaching that stage, you know, because um, people think, well, we fought this war, all these people have died. They can't have just died and have some, we'll have some sort of petty compromise over Donbass, uh, something that might have been acceptable before the 24th of February this year when the invasion started, but probably isn't acceptable now or just not politically feasible. So this drags on. Yeah, that's the way with wars, you know, that, uh, um, you know, this was true of the First World War, you know, pretty soon after it began, it became obvious, you know, that neither side was really going to win. But so many people have already been killed, and each side had so demonized the others that it had become impossible to end. And the uh, arms manufacturers uh, s smile. Sure, yeah, not just them. You know, this, um, you know, before the war started, there were you know a lot of American businessmen in the uh, oil and gas business, particularly in uh, you know LNG, liquefied natural gas who were going around Europe explaining the virtues of this compared to depending on Russian gas. You know, so, uh, and their, their dreams have come oh, true. When I say arms manufacturers, I don't just mean American. The, I th think it's, what is it, 30% mm. of the Russian workforce is in the arms industry, in the industrial workforce. Right, I, I didn't know that figure, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things they export, one thing that's meant to be sort of competitive. I mean, people may be looking at it again now that they had weapons that could could, could compete with others. Um, the uh, you know one of the sort of revelations about this has been the sort of apparent uh, sort of uh, uh, incompetence of the Russian military. I mean, one thing I did notice that uh, Novaya Gazeta, which is this uh, independent newspaper I mentioned before, did have a survey on what is the most corrupt. Uh, ministry in uh, Russia. Uh, I think it was some year ago. I think it was 2013, and they were surveying business and other people. They uh, came back, which was the Ministry of Defense. But you make an you important know, point in your article, I thought, which, if in fact this is incompetence uh, and mistakes, uh, they can learn from these mistakes. This is far from over. Yeah, that's the problem with wars that people are always sort of counting their chickens before they're hatched, you know. They think, you know, we're on a winner, we're bound to, um, everything's going to be okay. You know, one could see that with the U.S. in Afghanistan, and uh, I was there in uh, 2000, and uh, again in Iraq in uh, uh, 2003, um, and, uh, you know, they're completely overconfident and so forth. Uh, but then, the other side learns from their own mistakes, their own arrogance, and so forth. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, uh, they cook up some nasty surprises of their own. So, you know, this is by no means over, you know, it's sort of how far the Russians actually use their potential strength. Not very much, I'd say. Mm. Uh, and the um, hysteria they're creating, as, as, as much as there are Russian atrocities in Ukraine, and the invasion is unjustified and illegal, the hysteria in the United States about all of this, uh, it's, it, is at such a level, it's hard to see 
a negotiation, as you're saying, or are, are, are the Americans? Yeah, it's it's difficult to see that, and it's sort of, you know, it's one of the problems about the great sort of weight of, you know, I've been writing about wars. I started off with, you know, in Northern Ireland in the 1970s, and then moved to Beirut and so forth. But the, you know, war propaganda has always been part of war since the beginning of time. But it's, you know, it's these days the degree to which the other side is demonized makes it very difficult to compromise. I mean, even American diplomats in Damascus in uh, 2011 were saying that the media had so demonized uh, Bashar al-Assad early on that it became very difficult to persuade anybody to uh, negotiate with him, although they thought that negotiations were essential because it was sort of but proposing negotiations or compromise was like proposing, you know, shaking hands with the devil. And nobody would uh, nobody would agree to it. Um, politicians couldn't agree to it because it was too toxic. And you know, a similar thing has happened, I think, with Russia, that um, that the this sort of total demonization, uh, whatever you know, and certainly admitting you know the Russians have committed lots of atrocities and uh, the war is completely unjustified. But total demonization means that it becomes almost in possible to, to stop the war, and therefore, uh, you know, you get a vicious circle that more atrocities, and all wars involve atrocities. Because, because they, they uh, characterize what the Russians yeah. are doing as something extraordinarily evil, and of course, uh, not a word about what the U.S. has done on a far greater scale than Iraq and many other places. Yeah, it, it's, you know, it's sort of distressing this, and it's misleading. It's, uh, you know, to, this isn't to justify what the Russians are doing, or let's, or even what the Russians did in in Syria. You know, or well, the Syrian government did. You know, being in areas that they flattened with artillery and bombs. But if you just mention uh, news report after news report, uh, they mention what the Russians did in Syria, the Russian way of war, and there's never a mention of very similar cities. You know, Raqqa I mentioned was the sort of uh, Islamic State and uh, Mosul in Iraq, which exactly the same, you know, they were bombarded, they were flattened, you know, thousands of civilians were killed. So anything that's uh, like that is um, blamed on the Russians and on the Russians alone. And uh, this, first of all, it just isn't true. I mean, war is like that, unfortunately, you know, I mean, it's sort of... Um, and armed forces always lie about, you know, the tremendous efforts they make to avoid civilian casualties. But uh, when you actually, when anybody investigates, you find, you know, vast numbers of civilian dead. So, uh, so this partiality, I think, again, makes it very difficult to end the war because uh, people feel, you know, how can we have any compromise, even think about compromise, with that evil demon in the Kremlin? or indeed with any Russian, uh, you know, that sort of, uh, you know, I was reading about this afternoon, a, a Russian restaurant in London, which is fam was famous as a hangout for the Russian and Ukrainian opposition. But now, every time their phone goes, it's not somebody trying to book a table, it's somebody screaming abuse down the phone, saying, you Russian monsters, you know. Uh, and this makes it very difficult to, you know, to have any compromise, although compromise we'll have to have at some stage. All right. Thanks very much for joining us, Patrick. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget, there's a, I mean, your donations allow us to keep doing this. Uh, subscribe and, and please sign up on the email list.